Hello everybody, Tim Castleman here with the Straight Lace Two Drink Tim podcast. Let's get started. Hey, what up everybody, Tim Castleman here. Great to be here with you for another edition of the Two Drink Tim podcast. Today, we're going to talk about the value of vacations and why you should be stepping away from your business. But before I do, I want to take a second to thank everybody who sent me emails, private messages on Facebook and so on, and, and just tremendous ridiculously positive feedback based upon last week's episode about uh, watching your words apparently and happily I am not the only person that is in that same situation or scenario and I uh, I just want to thank you guys uh, per- personally as personal as thanking you on a podcast is I guess for uh, for all the great comments and feedbacks and uh, you know it's always nice to know you're not crazy and you're not alone uh, in the way that you think about friendships and value those so if you haven't had a chance to go listen to that one check it out if you have feel free to leave a review on iTunes for me and with that let's just freaking get started because we got a lot to talk about today and today we talk about one of my favorite subjects in the world and that is going on vacation that's right, going on vacation. I just got back. I just got back from seven days uh, in the wonderful Cancun, Mexico, where you could get liquid diarrhea all you wanted free of charge. But if you wanted a drink and a nice place to lay your head at night, it's about 4000 Uh We stayed at a, a great place called Sun Palace. We talked about it a lot in the last podcast. I don't want to bore you with it. But if you're looking for a good all-inclusive place, I recommend that you do that. So... I uh, take the trip every year. Uh, my wife and I uh, take the trip down to Cancun, Mexico, and they pay me a dollar every time I say it like that. Um, and we do it for a couple reasons. One, we are required through our business setup uh, to do corporate retreats. Um, so we hold our corporate retreat every year in uh, in some place exotic. The great thing is we have to hold the retreat. It doesn't say where we have to. And basically we go over the business, how it's going, you know, what's going well, what's going bad, what we need to change, what our challenges are, where we want to grow, so on and so forth. Um, so that's one of our primary reasons that we do it. But there's a secondary reason that I take TAM off, uh, t- or as I like to call it here in the South, time, not TAME, right? Uh, I take time off every year, and that is I want to give my business a chance to fail. Now, I know that may sound crazy, but listen to me. What I mean is I want to give it some time where I'm not meddling in it, an extended period of time, where I'm not meddling in it to see what happens. Do the wheels go off, right? Where do we have problems? Where do we have challenges? Because God forbid, we can't call them problems, right? Got to call them challenges or obstacles. Or I was reading something the other day. When the when the hell did the word disruptive become like a uh, hacker, right? Like, you know, oh, I got life hacker and mind hack and brain hack. Now it's like, oh, this is a disruptive piece of software. This is a this or that. It's like, unless you have a gun and you're going into a building, like that's disruptive, okay? The fact that you release a WordPress plugin is not going to disrupt the rest of the world. I hate to tell that to you, okay? And us, and our, or me, and our unofficial sponsor, back for another engagement. Love the abuse we gave them so much last week. They said, you know what? We're going to unofficially sponsor the podcast again this week. The El Dorado, which I believe, if you translate into Spanish, means... Uh, Bum's Nutsack. Yeah, that's right. That's a, that's a literal translation right there. Uh, I'm actually trying to finish off the bottle. It's not that great a rum. Got to be honest. I'd pass on the 12-year. Uh, try the 15-year. It's always been my philosophy. Go a little older, not younger, right? Uh, but uh, the Jew in me will not let me throw this bottle of rum out. So we're going to choke it down like I did most of my ex-wife cooking and get through it. So let's get back on topic as the ADD kicks in full blast. Okay. So why is it important to step away? It's important for you to step away from your business. One, okay, let's talk about the benefits we all know. You need to step away at some point. If your job is a creative or a business manager, your brain is going all the time. You're thinking about your va- you know, your business all the time. When you're sleeping, when you're awake, when you're with the family, when you're with the kids, when you're XYZ, you're thinking about your business all the time. So you need some time to kind of recharge the batteries. The way I did that this time, um, well, and I was good and bad, uh, is I did not take a laptop. I took no laptop. I didn't even take an iPad or or a Google Nexus tablet or a Chromebook or anything. Any of my 97 device gadgets. I didn't take any of that with me. Um, But I did take my phone. 
And that was a blessing and a curse. It was a blessing because I had to listen to music and write stuff and great stuff. It was a curse because I still had access to everything I normally would on my computer. And even though I couldn't do a bunch of things on there, I could still check in, see how things were going, so on and so forth. So I recommend you take some time. You get away. You let the brain um, just relax. If I had to do it over again, I probably would have bought a paper book, right? And uh, just like an MP3 player or something, I left my phone um, you know, off all week. That way I didn't have to worry about it. I wasn't checking messages, Facebook, anything like that. Because I feel like if you take three or four days and you just give your brain time to relax, that's when the stuff uh, pops up. Now, the great thing was, I, you know, I have recording software on my phone, so I was able to record a lot of ideas for the podcast, for business, so on and so forth. I think I would have gotten those ideas regardless, and worst case, I would have just written them down on this weird thing called paper and a pen and seeing if that works. So relaxation, right? Give your brain a chance to rest. Second thing is, okay, you have to give your chance, your business a chance to see, is it a real business? Does it succeed or fail with you in it? Now, you can do this even if you don't have assistance. So if I don't have assistance, here's how I would do it. I would pre-set up everything the week before I go to happen while I'm um, gone. Auto responders, whatever, auto webinars, you know, affiliate promotions, whatever it is, you can set that stuff all up in advance and just have it drip fed out there. Facebook post, who cares? That's what you can uh, you can be doing for it. OK, uh, if you do and you are blessed enough to have awesome uh, team like I do, here's what I recommend that you do. OK, you set a goal for what you want to happen while you're gone. So I met with my team, I think it was a Thursday or Friday before I left, uh, maybe it was Wednesday, I said, hey team, okay, next week you guys know I'm gone, all right, seriously, stop celebrating, no, seriously, stop celebrating, okay, stop high-fiving each other, uh, who farted, oh, that was me, okay, let's get back on task, right, so, uh, and I said, hey, these are the three or four things that I want to get done, now, here's the thing, okay, I was only gone for a week, I think I asked for two or three things to be accomplished during that time, that's it, Right? I could have gone and said, hey guys, look, I'm going to be gone next week. Here's the 10 things I want to do. No. I wanted to focus on one or two important, really key things that I wanted to have done while I was gone. One, to keep the, this, the actions necessary to my team specific uh, and actionable. But two, to be able to come back and not be like, well, okay, I gave you 10 things. You got four things accomplished. That's good. You know, it's like, well, how do you know that's good? But if I say, hey, here's the one thing I want you to get done next week, and I come back, and that one thing isn't done, then we have what we like to call a little situation that we got to have a little chatty chat about. Look at me being a gentleman and pause on the podcast while I take a drink of the old El Dorado. So you set a goal. And you say, hey, this is kind of what I want to have done. And you also set like an expectation or kind of a... I don't want to say a timeline, but basically like, hey, on Monday, let's do this. On Tuesday, on Wednesday, let's let's go from there and let's kind of see what happens. Okay, so that's the, the thing. You set your goals and you kind of set your uh, flight plan, if you will, for the time that you're gone. The other thing I recommend you do, uh, and this worked out. I wasn't. I wish I could say it was planned, so I'll say it's planned, but it was partially planned, partially luck, was stack the deck while you're gone. So I have recurring income, which we'll talk about on another podcast. And that typically comes in at certain times during the month. Well, it just so happened the week I was gone was the week that this recurring income was starting to, to rebuild for the new month. So the great thing was, even though I was gone, I was guaranteed to make a few thousand dollars, even though I was gone. So it's like, hey, you know what, if we do nothing, I've stacked a deck to where my rebills come in, I'll at least make two or three grand. So I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, I think it's important that you do that. Um, and that way, I mean, you know, you stack the, the deck. I mean, you have a better chance of winning, and that's what it's all about, right? So I'm like, well, you know, um, I really want to make things really difficult and hard on myself, and I really don't want to make any money, and God forbid I do any, you know, it's like, no, no, how about you do something? You know, um, how about you give yourself the better chance of success instead of the worst chance ever in the history of that? So uh, one way is obviously rebuilds. If you can do that, the other thing is to to pre-plan your promotions. Well, there were two or three products that had already launched that we had not been able to promote along with the product we were promoting ourselves. And I said, OK, here's the plan that I want to do that. It's also OK. And I, I don't think it's OK. It's mandatory that you give your team the ability to deviate and change when necessary and be able to do what they want. So I have a wonderful assistant who's been with me for a long time. Um, and she, while I was gone, with no direction uh, from me at all, went out and found a promotion 
that we mailed for that was off the cuff. I, like, I got the email and I was like, what the hell? I don't remember talking about this. But I gave her that freedom to do that so that she could do what she did, which was make me a ton of money. In fact, that, that unplanned promotion was the lion's share of the five figures that we brought in the week I was gone. So think about that. Had I been like, listen, you're going to mail these two things and that's it and that's all, I'd have missed out on, you know, four or five grand affiliate commission, my cut of a promotion that wasn't even planned when I went on vacation. So give your team the ability to deviate from the plan. You know, if she'd mailed that and it didn't do well, I'd be like, oh, well, okay, that sucks. Uh, but at least she took a shot. What I want from my team and what you should have want from your team is proactiveness. You want them to be out there looking for problems to solve and ways to make you money instead of waiting on you to constantly feed them like a mama bird. Be like, here, let me regurgitate to you. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's terrible, right? You want someone that goes, hey, look, I know Tim's out of the country, but I know he likes money. I see this offer's converting. Let's take a shot at it. Oh, wow, that did really well. Okay, bam. Great, fantastic. We're just going to keep banging that thing like a cheap drum. So that's what I did before I left. Then when I left, I periodically checked in. Now, this is good and bad. Like, I'm glad I did it, but to get a true representation, what I should have done was just disconnect from the team for the entire week and then come back and seen it. And again, a week may sound like a long time. Give it a weekend. Start off with a smaller trip. I, I didn't just, like, get an assistant and go on vacation for a week. This has been a process that's been almost two years in the making. And over time, as they've proven themselves to me more and more, I give them more and more responsibilities um, and more and more leeway to do what they want when they want. Instead of having to be like, hey, Tim, I, you know, I did this. I mean, by now, we know each other pretty well. If we don't, we shouldn't be working together. So she knows, hey, if I do this, it's going to really upset Tim or vice versa. So I checked in periodically. I just did that through Facebook, and it was just uh, Facebook and, and um, Gmail and Google. And I basically go check. We have a website. We go through JVZoo for a majority of our affiliate promotions. So I could just go there and see, like, oh, wow, hey, last, yesterday we made 2500 bucks. Like, things are going good. Or, hey, yesterday we made minus $17. So I would go there, check that. Then I would go check our customer support, which is uh, what was being done in Gmail. Now we've set up Zendesk like a big boy. Um, and I would check there just to make sure there weren't any fires. And if there had been a ticket or an email I thought it sat a little while, I would just respond to it very quickly. I, again, I shouldn't have done that. I probably should not have gone in there. I just was worried about a fire you know, happening and that I needed to, to kind of be a part of. Um, so check my affiliate stats, check that, and then checked in with the staff themselves. And basically, hey, how are things going? You know. And just real vague. Hey, things good? Yep. Anything I, you can need? Nope. Go enjoy your vacation. All right. That's it. In and out 15 minutes. I wasn't on it a half day, all day, anything like that. Just go in, meet with your team, hit them, you know, like every other day. So I think Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then when you get back, you know, you should have a big meeting or an autopsy, if you will, of, of the week and really be able to talk about, uh, for instance, uh, I'm going to have a staff meeting tomorrow where we're going to talk about when I was gone. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to ask questions like, hey, what went good? What went wrong? What did we accomplish? What didn't we accomplish? Why weren't we able to get that done? You know, what do we need to do better for next time? Because it's all a learning process. It's all a learning process and a learning environment for you as a manager but also them as an employee. I mean, uh, my assistant joked with me. She said, hey, we need to make six more bucks before you're allowed to come back in the country. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, I set a goal for us to make the X amount of dollars while you were gone. We're six bucks away. I don't want you to come back until I make that money. And of course you made the money. But here's the thing. I didn't say, hey, make a goal for this week. That's something she took on herself. So because she showed that initiative, that tells me I got the right person for the job right there. So that's what's really freaking awesome. Okay. So again, kind of a quick recap. Um, you know, you should go away because it uh, refreshes you. It gives you a little time to think, right? It also gives your team a chance to fail or succeed while you're gone. Do your best to stack the deck by having promotions lined up, by having rebuilds or anything recurring coming in while you're gone. That always helps. Either choose to periodically check in or don't with your team like I do. Give your team permission to deviate from the schedule if they deem it necessary. 
and that can work out really good or really not. You know, again, had that promotion not done as good as it done, I, sh I wouldn't be upset because at least she took a shot, right? I'd be more upset if she was like, hey, that promotion X that, uh, that did so well that everyone made a ton of money on. Yeah, I thought about mailing for that, but I didn't want to because I didn't think you'd be happy with it. Okay, and then when you're all done, sit down with your team and just have a complete autopsy and say, all right, I was gone. What worked really good? What didn't work good? Here's the things I asked to get done. Did those get accomplished? Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Why did they or did they not? What can we learn for next time? And use it as a learning, um, a learning situation and an ability to kind of know. Like, like I would have no problem leaving my business in my assistant's hand for a prolonged period of time. But that didn't start overnight. Start with a little weekend trip or a day trip. Starts with a weekend trip. And then it starts with, hey, I'm going to be gone for a week. You know, there may or may not be a month this year where I just tell my assistant, hey, I want you to run everything for the month. I want you to do it. I just want to step away. I want to decompress. I want to, you know, whatever. Go find my chi. But I don't have to be committed and beholden to my business. And I don't have to be in my business every day for my business to make me money. And that's the other thing. You may find that your business works better without you than it does with you. Meaning, could I just be that idea person, go to my assistant, they can get it done, and then I stay the hell out of the way. Because if I meddle in it, we make you know X money per month, but when they meddle in it, we make Y money. It's like, well, we should probably do more of Y and less of X. And I know that's hard because, you know, that's an ego play and it's my business and nobody else can do it better. Uh, not only can someone else do it better for you, they can probably do it cheaper for you. That's one of the things like uh, I, I always struggle with my Kindle people is it's like, yeah, you could learn to write a short story. You totally could. And it'd be beneficial and it'd help you for the rest of your life. And maybe you should do that as a hobby. Or you can go pay this person 50 bucks. They're going to work on it seven days a week. And before you know it, bam, you know, you're going to have a project done. I mean, we, we hired a writer for a set of three books okay a total of these books is going to be 15,000 words if I remember correctly um, we're paying them $150 for 15,000 words to give you an idea 15,000 words would probably take me a month unless I just talked it out like this so it's like and this person's been writing their entire life They've been writing these type of stories their entire career. They've been writing their entire life. They went to school to be a writer. They love writing. They have Writer's Digest. They have a fedora. You know, they have a typewriter. They like mint green tea. I, I don't know, whatever writers do. They are the stereotypical writer. So I'm getting all of their use and ability for the 30, 40, 50, 500 fucking years they've been leading up to be a writer for 50 bucks. For 5,000 words, which I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm going to do the old math here. That's, a, yeah, a penny a word. That, that's what the going rate is. Why the hell would I learn to write a short story where I can make a penny a word? Or I could create a course on how I got these short stories done and make $10,000. It's just simple freaking math. All right, so that's pretty much what I have for why you need to take a vacation. Um, but I want to talk about for the little remaining time we have here. Uh, another thing, which is like how to stay motivated. A uh, buddy of mine hit me up, but I'm not going to say too much about his situation because he probably doesn't want it out on Blast Street, but uh, he's a very successful online entrepreneur. But like me, he's taken a different and deliberately different path to that success. And he came to find out that the path that he's taken isn't exactly the one that he loves um, the most. So basically, he's done what I did back in the day, which is create a business that pays very well, but you hate everything about. You see, I, I liked doing offline marketing, and I loved teaching offline marketing, and I love teaching offline marketing more than I like doing the offline marketing stuff. And because of that, I had to do one to make the other happen. Meaning, if I didn't have an offline business, I didn't really feel comfortable teaching offline sales and marketing strategies. Okay, so that's that's what I mean by it. But I didn't like doing the offline. So eventually I just kind of burnt myself out and I burnt myself out because I didn't really care about the subject matter anymore. And I didn't want to teach it anymore because I couldn't stand doing it myself. Well, my friend is in the same situation. So my buddy hit me up and he's like, man, I'm not really sure what to do. And here's what I told him and I'm going to share it with you. Like, I think the reason we get burnt out 
or we get tired of something is because we lose the natural curiosity we once had for it. Like, if you think back to your first online experience where everything was brand new, it's like the first time you bought a, an ebook, the first time you bought a piece of software, the first time you bought this, or the first time you made a piece of software, or you put together an ebook, or you put up a buy button, or you learn how to do a sales page, everything was awesome and new, and every high was a newer high, and it was like, oh man, I made my first dollar online, holy crap. I remember one time I had a customer buy something that was non-IM related for 47 bucks, I started crying start crying like a little bitch because I was blown away by the fact that I could put something online and somebody would purchase it from me. Still blows me away. Still get giddy like a school child every time I wake up and I see PayPal notifications. I'm like, holy crap, I, I literally made money while I slept. That's awesome. Right? So everything is a new high. Your first five bucks, your first ten bucks, your first thousand, your first ten thousand, your first hundred thousand, your first half million, your first million, whatever it is, and you keep chasing that high going higher and higher and higher. But eventually what happens is you get stale because you're not hitting newer highs. Maybe you're plateauing. That's why people bitch about only making twenty thousand well, I only made twenty thousand dollars this month. It's like do you know how ridiculous that sounds to someone that has a nine to five? Okay. When I was in Mexico, I talked to the guy. He made $7 a day, $7 US a day. He said every two weeks, if it was a good tipping session, he would do $220. Now he made tips, I'm sure, and whatever, right? Um, but think about that. This guy's making 500 bucks a month on a good month. And I'm doing that sometimes during the day on a single day. Like that's just crazy when you think about it like that. But I will also say on the other side of that, it's very easy to get used to and accustomed to things. Two or three years ago, a thousand bucks a month was awesome. Now, if we're not doing a thousand bucks a day, I'm wondering what the hell's going on and you know why, why I suck at this, so to speak, right? So just kind of understand that. So because there's no new highs, we lose that natural curiosity. And the other thing is this, we're doing different roles. Like when you first get started, you're just creating, 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 creating content. It's awesome. It's wonderful. Then you got to do customer support. Then you got to do sales page setup. Then you got to do podcasts and you got to do webinars and you got to do blah, 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 blah. And before you know it, you're doing 50 freaking things. Well, the truth of the matter is we suck at all of about everything but two or three things. But we have to do those other things. Like I got to answer customer support email. I got to handle PayPal disputes. I got to issue refunds. I got to set up sales pages. Well, because we suck at these other things, we hate doing them, but they end up taking a majority of our time instead of the minority of our time. So the thing that used to make us the happiest, we got to do the most. Now, typically, we unfortunately have to do it the least. That sucks. Okay, unfortunately, we've all been there, uh, but that sucks. The key to that, by the way, if you're wondering how to fix that problem, outsource that stuff that you don't like. Like right now, I don't do my copy, I don't do the setup, I don't do customer support. All I do is do the creative stuff and the stuff surrounding that, like setting up, um, I don't know, setting up PowerPoint slides and different things like that. So I would recommend that you do the same, if at all possible. Find the things that you're really good at, outsource everything else. Yes, it will cost you some money, but you'll find you'll make more money because you're more productive because you're back to hitting that dopamine button and doing the thing that you love to do the most. It's like, man, if I could only do this one thing, I'd be a happy man. We'll just do that and get rid of everything else as quickly as possible. So not only are you doing that, the other thing is, right, we've lost the curiosity, we've lost the time to do it, but we just don't tinker, okay? One of my business associates, Brad Spencer, mentioned this to me one time. He said, oh, you got to have some time. got to have tinker time. You need tinker time, Tim. And I was like, hey, Tim, tinker time. Like that. Say that 10 times fast, especially when you've had a half a case of El Dorado like I have. Right? But it's true. You need to find time to put t stuff into the brain. Okay? It's just like a stove. You can't turn the stove on, put nothing in it, and then get mad at the stove in an hour when there's nothing to eat. You're like, where the fuck is the food? It's like, oh, well, you didn't put anything in there for the stove to do its job and produce this delicious, bountiful food for you. Well, your brain is the same way. If you're not reading, if you're not constantly checking out your competitor's products, going through your own products, whatever it is, you're not giving your brain food or the materials or the ingredients to make you an amazing dish. Okay. I have become more aware of the fact that I am 
not as original as I thought that I once was. Meaning I'm not like a strike of lightning hits me and it's like, oh my God, I can't believe I came up with the idea. That's amazing. Let's make it happen. I'm more of a, hey, I saw a little bit here. I saw a little bit there. I saw this here. And what happens if we combine all three of them? Oh, Shazam, things looking really good. Okay, so just kind of understand that going in, that you need to give your brain time to tinker and time to explore new things. I learn stuff every time I read something, watch something, or buy a, a product. And by learning that something, that gives me something new to test in my business. And it really is a slippery slope. Think about it like this, okay? I have a great buddy, Brad Goss, uh, who was once in the porn business. At some time, he was in the adult business, on the content side, not the creation side. He wasn't an actor. He had, as he would describe it, a nat penis and was unable to perform, right? And got... He got crazy around all the other monkeys. I don't know. I didn't ask him too many questions, probably because statues of limitation haven't run out on all that. Okay. He was in the porn business. Well, when he came over to the internet marketing side, he immediately, right? He immediately got validation uh, and verification and street cred, if you will, because he was in the porn business. So because he was legitimate in one business, it made him legitimate in the other. Okay. Now, eventually, he had to start making stuff on the IM side to keep himself legitimate to the IMers, but guess what happened? Then he goes back to porn and says, hey, guys, I want to speak at this event. And they go, well, of course we want you to speak at the event. You're an internet marketer. Look at that. You can teach us all this cool internet marketing stuff here to the porn people. So one legitimizes itself to the other. Does that make sense? The porn people are happy because he's an IM. The I am happy. I am people are happy because he was in porn, and he might actually know what it feels like to touch a woman. Okay, kidding. All my fellow I am virgins out there, please don't unite. Leave your mother's basement and come attack me. All right, please don't do that. So the same thing is true when it goes to products. You may get an idea of looking at a product for a product of your own, or you may say, you know what, I like this part of a product. I'm going to go test it out. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to report on the results. One product leads to another. But it doesn't happen unless you tinker, unless you give yourself some time to relax, and uh, you give yourself some time to do the things that you really enjoy doing and outsourcing the rest. So I'll definitely probably do a full-blown podcast on this at some point. I just kind of wanted to share that information with you because I know if he's going through it, you're probably going through it. And the other thing is I will say this. You can redo everything. You see, I'm no longer in the offline business and I don't teach that stuff and I don't allow that stuff to be sold online anywhere that I'm aware of. Okay. I thought, man, okay, business over time to go get the McDonald's hat, you know, start rehearsing. Would you like fries with that? The truth is you can recreate yourself at any point. I'm now primarily known as a Kindle publisher and trainer and speaker, author, whatever. Um, and that's awesome. But two years ago, I would have never thought that that's possible. So I will at one point probably delve into that topic, although that will take me many podcasts to get through. But the point is, used to be Dan Kennedy, I remember listening to him early in the day, he would say, hey, listen, um, you need to you know, plan to be in this business for the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. The truth is that time has become very compressed, okay? And you can, and I am living proof that you can say, I'm going to do a dead stop on this business, and I'm going to start this business up from scratch and get it up to the same, if not more profitable level within a year's time. Because that's exactly what I did when I switched from offline marketing to Kindle Marketer. And I totally recreated the way I marketed, and I totally... I totally redid my life and my business at the same time, and it was fucking amazing and extremely stressful and at times heartbreaking, but it is one of the, now kind of coming out the other side. It's taught me two things, and we'll end with this, right? One, it's it, I'm happier than I've ever been before, despite what this podcast may think, uh, listening to it sometimes. I'm, I'm happier. I'm running a business exactly how I want it with the people I want, stuff like that. So I couldn't ask for that to be better. The other thing it taught me was I can do this with anything. Meaning, if I said today, hey, I no longer want to be the Kindle guy. I want to be Facebook marketer number 974 fucking million, right? I know the process and the steps that I need to take to accomplish that. But I could do it for anything. If I wanted to become the article writing guy, if I wanted to become the 
you know, I don't know, postcard guy again, or whatever it is, I know the process and the steps that I need to take to be successful because I've already done it. I've already got the system down. I could just duplicate this to where in two years I could be back up, well, less than two years. I could be above the previous year's schedule. What I made last year, we've almost, uh, we're within, uh, I think, $50,000 of already doing that this year. So what I made the entire year of 2013 in less than six months, uh, probably by the six-month point, I will have made all of that money in 2014. I'm not saying that to brag or, hey, look how big my dick is or anything like that. I'm saying that to let you know that it's not only is it possible to do it and survive, you can actually freaking thrive because of it. So with that, we're going to bring this podcast to an end. Again, I appreciate all the listeners, appreciate all the amazing and tremendous feedback on all the episodes, especially last week's episode. I was happy to share that stuff with you, and I'll, I'll do that. We'll have Uncle Tim's story time, uh, I'm sure, again, very, very soon. Look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Thanks for all your kind words. Be sure to leave a review, and I'll talk to you soon.